Okay. <laughs> There we go. So hi, hi to everyone that's joining. Um, thanks for joining us today. We're gonna give it a couple more minutes to let folks um, come on in and then we'll we'll get going. Hi to everyone that's still joining. We'll give it another another minute and then we'll we'll get started. Cool. So I can see a few people still coming, um, which is great, but let's let's get going. Um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the third of these Rocky World discussions, um, the final one for, for the year. Um, we're looking at a slide, hopefully, um, with a kind of overview of what, what we're going to do in the next hour. Um, we've got about a 30-minute um, talk, and then we'll follow with a, a plenum discussion um, for the remainder of the time, and then, then close the meeting, um, looking then towards the, the, the discussions continuing continuing the new year. Um, just to remind you of the kind of the etiquette for the meeting, um, please use your, your full name so we know um, who's participating in the conversation. Um, stay muted during the talk and um, during the, the discussion afterwards, obviously with the exception of when kind of invited forward um, to a question. Um, and yeah, it'd be great to, if, you, if everyone could turn their videos on when contributing um, questions and stuff, it'd be great to kind of have as much of a kind of in-person meeting feel as possible during the discussion section. Um, so today it's my enormous pleasure to, um, to welcome Sujoy Mukapale from UC Davis to, to speak to us. I'm sure um, Sujoy and his work is known, known to many of you. Um, Sujoy is a real master of um, teasing out um, the, the secret history of our planet and other planets using noble gas isotopes and really exceptional measurements that have given outstanding insight into the, the history of our planet um, in its deepest past. So I'm enormously excited to hear from um, Sujoy today on volatile accretion and evolution in the terrestrial planets, um, a topic that really cuts across Earth sciences, planetary sciences, and is obviously so foundational for thinking about planets outside the solar system as well and their, their habitability. Um, so I'll stop stop sharing now, um, hand over to Sujoy, and um, excited to hear what you have to say. Thanks so much for joining us, Sujoy. Is the screen visible to everyone or? <clears throat> yeah. So thanks very much for that really kind introduction. And hopefully I can live up to the billing that you just 
uh, presented. And so thanks to all the organizers of the, uh, of the Rocky Worlds discussions for inviting me to talk here. Um, so as Ollie mentioned, I am going to talk about volatile accretion and evolution in the terrestrial planets from the point of what can the noble gases tell us about, uh, about this. And the key thing to keep in mind is that the noble gases are inert. So they don't participate in chemical reaction. And so in that respect, they are not particularly helpful as one of the elements that is essential for life. But the key thing is that because they're inert, they actually have a memory or they retain a memory of past events that the earth and other planets might have seen. And so that's the record that I try and disentangle. So the quick thing to keep in mind is that the reason why noble gases again are important is because volatile exchange between the mantle and the atmosphere is one of the foundational parameters for establishing the habitability of our planet. And that's the record that these noble gases uh, hold. And it's actually been challenging to read this record because of the very low abundance of the gases. So often we are talking about parts per trillion to parts per quadrillion levels of these uh, gases. And sometimes we boast that we are measuring only something like 10,000 atoms. So teasing that record out has been quite challenging. And most of the interior gases that we try and detect often get overprinted on the earth by shallow atmospheric contamination. And if you're looking at meteorites, often from cosmogenic gases. But based on the developments that a lot of groups have done, we are slowly getting to see this accretional record as more and more of the high precision observations of the noble gases uh, come out. And that's telling us a lot about this early degassing history of Earth, the volatile delivery to Earth, as well as for Mars. And so today I wanted to broadly touch upon two things, which is what do the noble gases tell us about accretion uh, beyond maybe what the major volatiles can tell us. And so by the major volatiles, I'm talking about hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen. And so I'll stick to two of the uh, noble gases primarily today, which are neon and krypton. And the thing to keep in mind is all of the isotopes that I'll talk about are going to be primordial or non-radiogenic, which means there's not going to be any kind of radioactive decay signals to worry about. So it's basically going to be fingerprinting. It's like, what is the DNA? And so I'll use these primordial isotopes to fin fingerprint where the gases might be coming from. Are they coming from the nebula? Are they coming from chondritic sources or might be coming from cometary sources? And I'll also touch upon some of the new work that is coming out from Mars, um, showing at least to me somewhat of a puzzling result. Okay. So with that, I quickly wanted to broadly define two terms so that uh, we are all on the same page. So we are looking at a cartoon uh, through the Earth's interior. So surface is here. This is the core mantle boundary down here. And I'll use terms like OIBs or plumes. And by that, I am going to be implying these deep upwellings that might be coming from near the core mantle boundary region. And so the plumes, the way you want to think about it is that these are sampling the deepest portions of the Earth's mantle. And then mid-ocean rich basalts or morbs, you want to think about as sampling the upper part, the shallower mantle, or the more depleted part of the mantle, meaning these are, this is the mantle that has really been stripped, upon, stripped off a lot of elements to make the continental crust, for example. So plumes would be deep mantle, and then morbs would be the shallower mantle. So now when we look at this following figure, which is showing us the major volatile composition. So the nitrogen isotopes on the y-axis, the deuterium to hydrogen ratio on the x-axis. Many of you might have seen figures like this. So this is from Marty. Uh, the protosoral nebula plots down here, um, low DH, low nitrogen 15, 14 comets plot up here. 
high DH, high nitrogen, 15 to 14. And then the Earth and Moon spots right smack on the chondritic gas compositions. And so if we look at this figure, we would infer that the Earth's volatiles are dominantly chondritic and that that's the major or maybe the only source of these volatiles to Earth. And there's a couple of questions to then keep in mind. One is, well, when were these chondritic gases delivered? Did their compositions slightly change? Meaning was there a different flavor of chondritic gases early on in accretion versus later on in accretion? And did the earth at any point accrete any solar gases? And so teasing these questions apart is what the noble gases often are particularly well suited to do. Again, because we don't have to worry about things like water rock reactions or any kind of chemical reactions that might change these isotopic compositions. And so when we see differences between reservoirs, that's really meaningful in terms of, again, fingerprinting potentially different sources for these different reservoirs. And so with that, let's look at the first set of observations from Earth. So we are looking at the ratio of neon 20 over 22. So again, we are just going to be fingerprinting our different sources. So on the left-hand side, we have the y-axis showing us the neon isotopic composition. High values are seen in the nebular gas here. The carbonaceous meteorites plot way down over here. And the Earth's atmosphere is low as well, very different from the nebula, and overlaps with these carbonaceous meteorites. But when we start looking into the deep interior, we see something different. And so this part is expanded on the right-hand side. And so this is, again, our nebular neon composition. And we start seeing these mantle plume values plotting very, very close to this nebular neon composition. And so that's one of the observations that is now forcing us to think that there must have been some amount of nebular gas that the Earth must have accreted very early on. We don't see the signature in the atmosphere, but we are seeing the memory of this signature in the deepest part of the mantle. The other interesting observation you might see is that we are seeing a very resolvable difference between the mid-ocean ridge basalt, which is our shallower mantle, and then these deeper plume basalts, which are the deeper mantle. And the exact reason for this is not yet clear. Um, this could reflect potentially a difference in source composition. So I'm plotting on the right, what is called solar wind irradiated material. So in this case, when dust grains might get irradiated along the edge of the gas disk by solar radiation, the neon isotopic composition ends up being a little different than the nebular gas composition because this implantation produces a slight isotopic fractionation that enriches the dust grains in the slightly heavier isotope. So that's why the solar wind irradiated material composition is lower than the nebular gas composition. And so this mid-ocean ridge basalt source might be reflecting of material that had seen this solar irradiation being delivered a little later in the accretion history. But equally, we cannot rule out the possibility that maybe what we are also seeing in this case is subduction of atmospheric neon into the deep earth. So if we inject atmospheric neon into the deep earth, then we might be slowly decreasing these ratios away from the nebular value. And a larger input of the subducted gases would therefore result in a slightly lower value, less input of the subducted gases would not deviate the ratios from the original nebular gas values to such an extent. But independent of why this mid-ocean rich source is a little lower, I think we can have a pretty strong conclusion that these mantle plumes can really only be explained by this nebular gas source because there is nothing, there's no other reservoir in the solar system that's up here at these high values. So that's then a powerful constraint on 
planet formation or especially for Earth's formation because we are now concluding that this neon 20 over 22 in these plume derived basalt because it's input because it's recording this nebular gas signature we must be growing earth to a sufficiently large size at least greater than the size of mars in the presence of the nebula to capture the gas and then dissolve it and inject it into the earth's interior so we can't just capture the gas and have it be stuck as a atmosphere. We actually have to get it into the Earth's interior. And so retaining basically solar gas in the presence of a magma ocean is quite challenging. And that's where the mass of the planet will have to become important. And we think Mars would be the minimum size, but a Mars-sized object would have a pretty hard time retaining solar gas in the atmosphere if it has a magma ocean. So we think it might more be in the size range of two to three Mars size uh, prior to the dissipation of the nebula. The other important thing is observations like this, where we are seeing nebular gas being incorporated into the Earth, allows us to then place Earth's formation in the astrophysical context. It allows us to infer planet formation in a gas disk. And an example is being shown here for the TW Haya gas disk where we are seeing potentially a clearing at about one AU with the clearing representing the possibility of a planet at this uh, radial distance in, again, in the presence of the gas disk in this case. But an equally interesting question now might be, well, if you're seeing the neon signature for the solar gas or for the nebular gas, What's happening to the nebular hydrogen and nitrogen? Why are we not seeing that signature? Um, so what happened to that hydrogen and nitrogen? Where did it get lost? And why did it preferentially get lost compared to neon? So I don't think I have a final answer to that. And that's one of these open questions in my view. Um, the follow-up to this would be that, you know, if we are losing nebular hydrogen, then we are going to necessarily be changing the redox state of our planet. But let's move on to looking at some of the other noble gases and see if they are providing also the same information. And in this case, let's look at one more of the noble gases, krypton. And in this case, krypton has multiple isotopes uh, about six actually, I'm not plotting all of, or not labeling all of them here. So here are all of our krypton isotopes. The key thing is I'm not going to talk about all of them. On the y-axis is the isotopic composition. And this is basically the composition of a reservoir normalized to a standard. And in this case, our standard is air. And all of the krypton isotopes ultimately get normalized to 84 krypton, which is why all the compositions basically cross over at this particular point. The more important aspect of this figure is the difference in pattern that we are seeing amongst the different reservoirs. So the Earth's atmosphere is flat, and this is simply because we are using Earth's atmosphere as our standard. So standard over standard minus one would always give a value of zero. So that's what we are seeing here. The sun's composition plots up here. And effectively what this means is that the sun is richer in the lighter isotopes of krypton compared to Earth's air. And then we have two of these components. One is called component Q. And this is basically a carbonaceous uh, carbonaceous material in chondritic meteorites. And we think the material might be something like graphene. And it hosts something like 90% of all of the krypton in, in meteorites. But especially when we look at carbonaceous chondrite, we see 10% of other material in presolar grains. And so for that, we use the term AVCC, which basically is the mean composition of all carbonaceous chondrite. And the addition of pre-solar components to this graphene or carbonaceous component in meteorites moves down 
the carbonaceous chondrite compositions a little bit. Now, when we look at things like instatype chondrites and ordinary chondrites, sometimes the only thing that we see in those non-carbonaceous meteorites is this Q gas. And then when we look at carbonaceous chondrite, the mean value of the carbonaceous chondrite, we see this composition, which again is this Q gas plus the presolar components. So effectively what we are again doing is kind of this pattern matching. And what I'm going to now show is not all of the krypton isotopes, but some of these krypton isotopes and use these in terms of figuring out what might be going on in terms of looking at Earth's deep interior and figuring out does krypton also give us the same story as what we saw for neon. And so here are two of our krypton isotopes, krypton 78 on the y-axis, krypton 86 on our x-axis, or it's air plots here, the mean value of carbonaceous chondrite, ABCC is down here, the Q gas composition is here. And the thing to remember is in this space, if you have a mixture of two reservoirs, it'll basically be a straight line. And so what we are seeing are a couple of compositions from mantle plumes up here and the composition of mid-ocean ridges down here. And all of these three uh, samples we know also show some indication of subducted air. And so what we can infer is that the mantle composition must lie along a mixing line between air and this projection somewhere down here. So we don't know exactly where, but somewhere along this mixing line is where the mantle composition is forced to lie. So a couple of important takeaways from this figure is this mixing line definitely does not go through the Q composition, which as I said, is often the dominant composition in things like instatite chondrites and ordinary chondrites. This mixing line appears to be close to the mean value of carbonaceous chondrite, but does not again pass through the mean value of the carbonaceous chondrite. It's missing it. And more importantly, what we have now figured out is that there is a depletion in this heaviest of krypton isotope 86. So in the lighter krypton isotope, the Earth's composition matches fairly well with the chondritic composition, but in this heaviest of the krypton isotope, there is a deficit. And so this deficit is shown in this particular figure where we take all the light krypton isotope, model it as a mixture of either carbonaceous chondrite or air, carbonaceous chondrite and solar, Q or air. And then based on this mixing proportions from the light isos isotopes, we say, okay, predict what the heavy isotope composition would be. And so that's what this bars are showing. These are the predicted heavy isotope composition, krypton-86 composition that our sample should have based on its light krypton isotopes. And what you see is that the measured value is always lower. So the measured value then has this depletion in this krypton-86. And that's kind of interesting because in a whole suite of other refractory elements, we see the same neutron or depletion in the most neutron rich of the isotopes. And so we were hypothesizing that this is the same kind of effect we are seeing now in a volatile element. That this is then indicating that the delivery of those refractory elements might very well be coupled to the delivery of the volatile elements. And that Earth's composition might be close to carbonaceous, con might, sorry, might be close to instatite chondrites, but they are not a perfect match. So we so far have not been able to identify a single meteorite that has the correct fingerprint for all of our krypton isotopes. And so again, this is one of the open questions in what might that be implying? But if we come back to this plot again, another key aspect of this particular mixing line would be that both the deep mantle and the shallower mantle are on the same mixing line. That means that the 
sources for both the deep mantle and the shallow mantle are the same. So there wasn't, at least during the main phase of accretion, we are not seeing substantial differences. So we saw differences in the neonisotopes. Um, we know there are differences in some other short-lived radioisotopes, but when we are looking at the fingerprint of the krypton isotopes, we are not seeing a difference. And so what we are hypothesizing is that there must have been early delivery of some kind of carbonaceous material delivering this krypton, but that there wasn't a significant change in the composition during the main phase. And again, we call this AVCC-like because it's close to the mean composition of carbonaceous chondrite, but it's clearly not identical to it. And just to put in another quick fingerprint of a different isotope, xenon, here our mixing systematics are going to be hyperbolic. And again, what we see is a single hyperbola will constrain or will have all of these observations lying on it, meaning that these mid-ocean rich basalts and these plumes are lying on the single hyperbolic mixing line between the atmospheric composition, which is being subducted into the mantle, and the original mantle composition, which is somewhere here. And again, we are seeing no signature of solar gases for these heavier noble gases. So the light noble gases are showing us the nebular signature. The heavy gases are not showing us this nebular signature. And so the important takeaway from this is that the krypton isotopes therefore might be telling us that these chondritic like gases were being accreted very early on because we are seeing in the same sample the nebular fingerprint of neon and the chondritic fingerprint of krypton. And the potential interpretations of this is that early delivery of chondritic material may be from the outer solar system. We are not yet sure because we don't have a great match, but we don't think that these sources did not change, but we think that the sources did not change significantly during the main phase. And so again, one of the key questions is, what's the meteoritic fingerprint that matches the Earth's Krypton composition in the interior. Is there any meteorite with the right fingerprint? So now let's look at the relationship between the Earth's surface reservoir, which is the atmosphere and the interior. So again, we are looking at two Krypton isotopes on our x-axis, two other Krypton isotopes on the y-axis. The critical part again is not the specific krypton isotopes, but what these mixing relationships might be telling us. So you've already seen in my previous figure that the Earth's atmosphere was different than both the solar composition as well as the chondritic composition. And the critical point is that the mantle composition is also now very distinct from the atmospheric composition. So that means that the atmospheric composition must have been established after the last major equilibration between the surface and the interior, which was the moon forming impact. So if you start thinking about what the late veneer might be, if all of our late veneer is going to be chondritic or similar to the mean composition of carbonaceous chondrite, then maybe the atmosphere would be plotting here and not up there. And in this figure, you see another data point up here with huge error bar. This is the comet 67P uh, appears. So one of the critical points is that we cannot mix this cometary signature with this carbonaceous chondrite signature and get at the atmospheric composition. And so what Becker et al. had suggested was that the atmospheric composition might be a mixture of this Q gas and this cometary composition. But I'd already shown you that the interior doesn't have the same chemical fingerprint as Q. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this figure. So this is the same space. So here is the mean value of carbonaceous chondrite. Here is the 
mantle value, here is air, and here is the Q gas. And so Beckert et al. were suggesting you're seeing a mixture of Q gas, which is constrained or which is contained in these ordinary chondrites and instatite chondrites and some differentiated uh, achondrites. So if the mantle composition is here, then the mantle outgassing is not supplying a significant amount of the atmospheric gas. And so almost all of this atmospheric gases must be coming after this moon forming impact. And that's a challenge because now we are bringing in two additional sources of volatiles after the formation of the moon. And more importantly, one of the difficulties is that to get this budget of Q gas that we see in the atmosphere, we have to sample something that is unusually rich. So for example, if we have to explain the Q gas via delivery of instatite chondrites, we would need something like 25% by mass of the Earth's weight. And that's obviously nonsensical because the late veneer might be up to two or 3% if we think it might be differentiated material. If it's chondritic material, it's more like half a percent. So what this is saying is this is a challenge in terms of understanding where the atmospheric gases might be coming from. It is conceivable that maybe what we are seeing instead of being a Q comet mixture might be a mixture of interior gases with solar gases. But where the solar gas might be coming from is unclear because the solar gas, we don't see it in bulk in any kind of meteorite so far. It is possible that maybe comets trap some of the solar gas when ices are being formed in the outer solar system, but that's a conjecture. The one comet that we have sampled, 67P, certainly does not have this composition. But in any case, what you would come away with is to say that the atmospheric fingerprint requires a source not contained in the Earth's mantle. And that means that during this stage, there was a different part of the solar system that was being dynamically excited to throw certain objects into Earth's crossing orbits that were not present during the main phase of accretion. So some of the important questions associated with the atmospheric signature is that, you know, could we get most of the gases via outgassing and then bringing in a component that we haven't sampled yet, or do we require two additional sources like a comet 67P plus still some gas rich objects that we haven't seen yet? But in either case, it's a different region of the solar system that is being dynamically excited during this part of Earth's formation. And so the question is well, what is the nature of the late veneer? Because again, if it's purely carbonaceous chondrite, we won't be able to explain the atmospheric fingerprint that we are observing today. And so in the next couple of minutes, let me quickly show you what we are learning from Mars in terms of how Mars might be a little similar or a little different from Earth. And again, I'm gonna be relying on the Krypton isotopes. And so here are two Krypton isotopes, 83, 84, 86, 84. Again, we are just doing pattern matching. The composition in this particular space, the sun's composition is down here. The carbonaceous meteorite composition is up here. And now very interestingly, the atmosphere of Mars overlaps beautifully with the solar composition. It cannot be distinguished. You cannot distinguish Krypton in the Martian atmosphere from the sun's composition. It's identical. So when we look at meteorites, the only meteorite where we think we have a clear signature of interior Martian gases is Chesigny. And these error bars are indicating that measurements were not made with high enough precision to figure out whether the interior had a chondritic signal or a solar signal. And then, as I had said, cosmogenic gases pull you down here. And that's been one of the challenge in terms of isolating what the interior fingerprint might have been. And so in our recent work, what we found was from this meteorite Chassigny, we were able to tease out the two different components of interior gas and the cosmogenic gas. So the cosmogenic gas lies here. And 
again, two component mixing, the two components being interior and cosmogenic would be a straight line. And in this case, the mixing line passes right through the composition of these carbonaceous chondrite and is very far away from the composition of the sun. And so we know that Mars's accretion happens pretty early. Like the mean time of accretion is something like 1.8 million years. And so the fact that we are seeing chondritic gases in the interior of Mars is quite telling because it's definitely forcing us to accept that there were chondritic volatiles in the early part of the solar system in the terrestrial planet forming region. But equally challenging is understanding where the atmosphere is coming from. So in a schematic way, increasing krypton ratios, the sun's composition is here, the chondritic gas composition is here, the interior composition is here. So if I outgas my interior, I don't get my atmospheric gas composition. If I outgas my interior and I lose the atmosphere, I move further away from the atmospheric composition. And so that means that after Mars interior had basically closed to accretion, we have to bring in the solar gas. So the startling observation, it's almost pure chondritic in the interior, pure solar in the exterior, which is kind of a backward way of thinking about planet formation, where we normally think of starting with some nebular gas composition and then adding in the chondritic gases. And here exactly it's the reverse. So there isn't a very clear picture or a complete picture, at least in our heads, as to what processes this might be related to, but it does indicate there has to be very limited outgassing between or very limited exchange between the interior and the exterior. So I'm going to skip this and end with the summary so I can uh, take questions and have more of a discussion. So hopefully one of the things that in this brief presentation you have seen is that the noble gases are fingerprinting almost all of the sources that we think about volatiles. We are seeing a nebular fingerprint. We are seeing chondritic gases. We are potentially seeing cometesimals, all being sampled by the earth. And we are seeing this very early presence of chondritic gases in the inner solar system, both from the record of Earth as well as from Mars. And then understanding the process that leads to having a pure solar krypton in the Martian atmosphere is still an open question in my view. And what this tells us about the early conditions on Mars in terms of the early composition of the atmosphere is an interesting avenue in terms of further exploration. And then lastly, for the Earth, we think the late veneer appears to be quite different from the interior gases, and we need a different source than was sampled during the main phase of accretion. And so with that, I will stop. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Sujoy. That was a absolutely fantastic tour through the possibilities of these rare, uh, non-interacting gases, they're even rarer isotopes and the, the astounding um, physical processes throughout the solar system they give us insight to. It's always amazing. And you very modestly didn't emphasize the analytical triumph that is some of those measurements. Um, so that's also um, amazing to see the, these kind of tiny signals teased out of these, these rocks. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions. I'm going to, I can see Craig with a hand up. Yes, yeah, so if you want to come on and ask their question, please put your hand up or you can put it in the chat and I'll I'll ask the question. Um, I'm going to I'm going to take a privilege and ask the first question, if you don't mind, Craig, but then I'll, and then I'll hand over to you. Um, I'm just really fascinated by the the discrepancy between the krypton and the neon or maybe discrepancy is the wrong word, but for that you showed for Earth. So we've got a nebula neon signature that we can see was was ingested by, by the planet during its growth. Um, at the same time as samples showing the chondritic krypton signature, how, yeah, how is it both those things came to be in the same sample? Is there like a, a gas solubility based explanation that could do it or a recycling efficiency story? Or how do we, how do we imagine that being put into it? So, yeah, so great question. So that's exactly where I would say this is one of these physical constraints that is being put forth because we think it is related to solubility. So when we look at solubility, for example, neon, 
has a higher solubility in a magma ocean compared to krypton. So if we are dissolving the nebula gas into the magma ocean, we would preferentially dissolve neon over krypton. And then when we look at a chondritic pattern, we see that in chondrites, neon is depleted compared to the heavier noble gases. So we think, it, so it's basically telling us we have to fine tune this delivery of carbonaceous material and the amount of ingested gases to the right amount so that we see this crossover happening where the crossover is telling us, okay, for this partial pressure of nebular gas and this amount of chondritic material coming in, we will have a neon signature from the sun and a krypton signature from the chondrites. Hmm. So that's what kind of gets me excited in terms of thinking about this is this is the constraint on the process. Yeah, that's a super cool, super cool constraint coming out. Then if I guess it's bringing in experimental petrology or whatever is constraining the, the gas solubilities, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, Craig, you were next with the, the hand up. Yeah, awesome talk. Um, I was wondering two things. One, how do you weight the analyses of different carbonaceous chondrites to get your mean value? Like what's that based on? And second question, what's putting your limit on you have to get to Mars size to start this ingassing process? And how much do we really know about how efficiently that would cycle noble gases into the deep interior of planets? Okay, so let me address the first one. So the mean composition of carbonaceous chondrites um, is basically using a bootstrap approach for all of the measured compositions of CI, CM, CVs, and COs. The, the reason why we didn't actually pull these out into different groups, by the way, is that the record is still pretty sparse and the measurement quality is actually not that great compared to what we can do today. So we are slowly starting to work on that. So we have now basically come to the point where I would argue that our understanding is being limited by the observations from meteorites. Mm -hmm. um, so the next target actually would be to look at these different classes of meteorites and tease it apart in terms of what is the compositions of CVs, COs, CIs, and CM groups. Uh, so, one thing I would like to say is the Krypton is saying it is not the same as the mean composition of carbonaceous chondrite, which means that if I close my eyes and randomly pull up five carbonaceous meteorites, it doesn't look like that. But it doesn't imply it could not be a specific class of carbonaceous meteorites. Uh, and the reason I don't want to go there yet is because we feel we don't have the data quality to make that argument. Um, so uh, did that answer the first part? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then the second part was uh, what controls the size uh, in terms of ingassing it, right? Um, so this is something that we've been uh, working a little bit, uh, Hilke Schlichting, in terms of seeing um, what mass planet can hold on to a magma ocean, sorry, can hold on to a, hydrogen rich atmosphere in the presence of a magma ocean. So we see that for Mars, Mars can have something like a bar or a few bars of hydrogen, so long as its surface temperature does not exceed seven, 800 degree Kelvin. Mm -hmm. uh, as the temperatures go up, it gets much harder to retain or hold on to the hydrogen. Uh, so Mars can certainly have hydrogen, but it ends up being very difficult having it in the presence of the magma ocean. Uh, and it's at that two to three mass, two to three times mass size object that we start seeing surface temperatures of 1500, 1600 Kelvin and the ability to still have bars of hydrogen at the surface. Cool, thank you. Uh, James, James Bryson, you got your hand up as well. Hi, Sujoy. Um, really nice talk and a very clear description of a, a co really complicated topic. Um, I just wanted to kind of get your sense on um, the recent measurements that the interior of the Earth 
uh, in 15 nitrogen and deuterium compositions is similar to the anisotropic chondrites. Um, so I guess two questions following on from your answer to Craig's question and uh, Ollie's question. Do we have an anisotropic chondrite measurement of neon? And uh, if, if, if you were to speculate, how can we reconcile the apparent similarity in deuterium and 15 nitrogen with the uh, the crypton and neon that are suggesting we don't have a meteorite batch for the interior of the Earth? So uh, my first question is, I'm not sure I would be able to reconcile it, but I'll, uh, I'll give you kind of my view. Um, so in enstatite chondrites, again, we don't have really great measurements of things like krypton and xenon. But the few that we do appears to show off in this Q gas signature, meaning it shows the Q composition. And the krypton in the interior definitely does not look like Q. It is pretty far away from that. Um, but we also know, you know, when we look at things like titanium isotopes and chromium isotopes and ruthenium isotopes, the Earth is closest to instatite chondrites, but it's not an exact match. And there is a nucleosynthetic anomaly. And what the krypton is saying is that basically there is a nucleosynthetic anomaly with respect to even Q. Um, and so it's very possible that we won't have any perfect match for the interior composition. When it comes to looking at the neon composition for instatite chondrites, it becomes a little challenging. Some of the instatite chondrites show a fingerprint of this solar irradiation. Um, the challenge has been trying to figure out when that solar irradiation happened. Did it happen very early on in the solar system prior to accreting the instatite chondrites? Or did it happen at a much later stage during, because most of the instatite chondrites are often breaches. And so they might have been irradiated sometime in the recent past, which is which would have nothing to do with early solar system processes. So understanding when that irradiation happened is a little bit challenging. Um, okay, thank you. So yeah, I don't think I addressed your question satisfactorily because I don't think currently there is a satisfactory explanation. No, I, I, I think you're right. It's a, it's a particularly complicated topic that's evolving quickly. So we, I mean, if we, if we had really precise, you know, neon measurements of the antichondrites to relate to their nitrogen and, and deuterium would be, would be amazing. It would be. And so one of the strategies that we are trying to basically go forward is to make the noble gas measurements in the same aliquot as the nitrogen isotope measurements and the deuterium measurements and the chromium measurements and so on. So we put some proposals in to try and do this work because that data set doesn't exist. So in some respects, we know that, you know, if we look at different parts of the same meteorites, we will see different compositions for hydrogen and nitrogen as well. And the noble gas measurements are just made in a completely different output. So we are comparing it, not apples to apples exactly in the samples so far. Uh, and so if as a group, we can start thinking about how to do these measurements on the same material, I think that would really move the field forward as well. Thank you. Can I just ask um, CJ for just for information on the top on that topic, the enstite chondrites? What phase is hosting the noble gases in the enstite chondrites? Is it more graphene material or? So in the in the enstite chondrites, there hasn't been a very clear search carried out for the exact co carrier composition. Um, the graphene was detected in, I believe, an ordinary chondrite. But the Q gas composition has the same fingerprint in all of these different bodies. And so it's theorized, at least, that they started off with this graphene. And graphene is pretty resistant to high temperatures. Um, so you know, if the enstatite chondrite has a Q gas signature, chances are we would be able to see it. Now, identifying the graphene actually was years of really hard work. And even in that case, it's not a perfect experiment because once the graphene was isolated, there was so little of it that following the TEM work, you couldn't analyze that material for the noble gas fingerprint. So the idea was that, yes, this is 
where it was stored, but you still have to take that final leap of faith and say, and the gases were in this material that I isolated. Yeah, yeah. Cool, more detective work to do. Uh, Tim, you had your hand up next. Uh, sure, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sudra, for this very nice talk. Um, yeah, so I have two questions. Uh, one is related uh, to a speculation, or like maybe you have a speculation about what this means. So you're saying that most of the early accretion, or there's at least this these measurements suggest there's a lot of early accretion of carbon ashes material. So now I was wondering two things about this. First, what exactly do you mean when you talk about um, this material? In which aspects does it overlap specifically, which is related essentially to to what you said that we don't have a meteorite to really or that expresses exactly the composition we search for. Um, and then I want was interested in uh, your physical speculation, what this may mean for early accretion. I mean, the physical mechanism of accretion that lets the protoplanets grow in the inner disk. Um, so this is my first question. And then the second question is, uh, you you sort of uh, asked about this. Uh, well, how do you think, or what do you think is the relation of this to the nucleosynthetic for more uh, isotope and anomalies from more refractory um, elements? Um, when you say that they that you see this change in accretion happening. Okay, uh, so in terms of your first question, uh, the reason why I said carbonaceous material and not carbonaceous chondrite is because it's clear that it doesn't go through the carbonaceous chondrite or the mean value of the carbonaceous chondrite. But in almost all of the material, all of the meteorites that we have sampled, the major phase that's always present is this Q gas. And it's usually Q gas plus some other sprinkling of pre-solar material that is changing the compositions around. And as I said, the Q gas is known to be associated with carbonaceous material, maybe graphene. And so that's the context that I'm talking about, that it is this carbonaceous material that is coming in and there is likely other stuff coming in with it. Because every meteorite has this Q composition, whether it be an enstatite chondrite or a carbonaceous chondrite or an ordinary chondrite. So it means there is carbon rich material that the earth is accreting early on. So it's not just silicate. So that's the context that I'm meaning as opposed to fingerprinting to or pointing to a specific body. And I can't point to a specific body because I don't yet know what that body might be. And I, did that answer the first part of the question? Okay. Um, so again, it's not a meteorite body that I'm thinking of, but material that I'm thinking of, um, that it's this some carbonaceous carrier that is bringing the gas in. And then in terms of the, of the physical process, that's another really open question. So if this is related to, if this is related to, for example, delivery from the outer solar system, that if it is coming in associated with some CC type material, that might be then the indication of scattering of outer solar system planetesimals very early on, potentially associated with the grand tack, where we know that Jupiter is moving in when the gas is still present, right? So one of the signatures we are seeing is this nebular gas and the krypton from some kind of a chondritic source being present in the same material. So it would be possible to then explain it why this accretion of outer solar system planetesimals. But if it is inner solar system planetesimals, I don't yet know what that would directly imply. And part of it is we don't yet have a mechanism or we don't yet have a clear understanding of the astrophysical context of how you produce this Q gas carrier. So that's, that's another really interesting avenue to pursue. Like, how did you trap this gas in this carbonaceous material? Right. And understanding that context would be important because if we find out that the only place you can do this would be outer solar system, 
that would mean that before you make the instatite chondrites and the ordinary chondrites, you have to get this carbonaceous material into the inner part of the solar system. But if you find that you can actually do it over a very large spatial scale in the early solar system, then it might not have any special spatial context. Fantastic. Sean, you've been patiently waiting. Thank you. Do you want to ask your question? No problem. Uh, uh, thanks. You, oh, sure. Sorry, I think Tim had a second question that I've now. Uh, oh, right. Tim was being greedy. So even if he did, let's let's keep going. Uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I felt like already probably three or four questions have been answered. <laughs> Go on, Sean. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, if I understood it correctly about the the neon, uh, one of the implications was possibly that some. And the measurements kind of indicated that there were two discrete times when material was collected there, that there was a main accretion and then another discrete period where maybe uh, neon affected by the, the solar wind arrived at the Earth. Is the understanding that it was two discrete periods of accretion like this, or is it more of a gradual accumulation of material that's not borne out by those measurements? So I think the measurements won't be able to tell us whether it was a discrete event or whether it was a gradual transition. And moreover, I think we still don't have a agreement as to whether those values that are overlapping with the solar wind values are actually solar wind irradiated material or whether it might be subducted air. The atmospheric neon, by the way, does require a very different source than the interior that does appear to have, again, more of this chondritic flavor. Uh, so that would be an, a discrete event after the formation of the moon. Great. Amy, do you want to finish up with your question? Yeah, thank you. It's really, really interesting talk. Can I ask a really naive question? Is, do we Absolutely, have a good yeah. understanding? And if not, how might we kind of gain that of why there's a difference in, say, the cryptonisotypes between the, the nebula gas and the chondrites, when surely they must have formed out of the nebula gas to start with? So one, um, one reason why there's going to be some difference is that the chondrites have some pre-solar compositions, which have really exotic, really exotic isotopic compositions. So in this case, when people have isolated pre-solar silicon carbide grains, the measurements differ from the gas composition by several tens of percent. Uh, so they're not, they're not tiny at all. Um, this follow-up part is a little bit harder to understand, which is, the, as I said, most of the gases in chondrites are associated with this Q gas, which is in a carbonaceous phase. And that's again, where we don't really understand how this phase was made and how the gases in that phase got trapped. So there is one line of thought that says that this is basically during the trapping process, this is fractionated nebular gas. So when this carbonaceous material was forming, it trapped the nebular gas, but the process fractionated the gases. So it turns out that might be a okay explanation, but in detail, it doesn't work because the isotopic fractionation does not match it beautifully. So the relation between the Q gas and the nebular gas is not entirely clear. Um, and if you ask my opinion, I would still say it is some it is some fractionated component of Q gas, sorry, some fractionated uh, component of nebular gas to which additional pre-solar material might have been added. And then on top of that, there might be other pre-solar material like you know, nanodiamonds in the meteorites, hibonite, corundum, and so on. Okay, thanks. So Thank it's, you. you know, it's a tricky question. <laughs> you might think it's a naive question, but it's a really difficult question to answer in many respects. And it's it's one of those questions that I, I think we do need to understand to better 
figure out what this record might be telling us because knowing this astrophysical context is going to be critical in terms of understanding why this carbonaceous material appears to be present everywhere. That's fantastic. Um, thank you. Thank you so much again, um, Sujo, for that talk and for guiding us all through such a, a kind of rich topic, um, but kind of showing us a clear path through to these really exciting insights that the noble gases can offer um, and pointing at some exciting areas for future work as well, all the way from earth science, planetary science to the kind of astrophysical questions of dynamics and the origin of materials in the pre-solar context. Um, so really fantastic talk to kind of um, connect all parts of the Rocky Worlds community. Um, thank you so much. Um, this is the last one of these talks for the for the year. Um, we'll be beginning again in the new year. Um, 2nd of February, we're hearing from Yasuhito Sakin on considering chemical evolution toward life on Earth and from Enceladus. Um, the discussion series will be continuing um, throughout 2023. So stay posted on Discord. I should say there's a poll on Discord where you can express your preference between this kind of plenary type discussion we've had today and the breakout room mode. So please do vote on that. Um, and yeah, stay in touch through the Discord. And thank you again, CJ, for joining um, early in the morning. To thanks, thanks everybody for asking your great questions and thanks for the invite. Yeah, and great to see you again, CJ. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Bye.